There's one line, the gospel story for today, the gospel before Sunday after Pentecost, that um, gives us a little bit of an insight into the workings of grace in the souls of the apostles. And that's where St. Peter, after um, he has um, heard Jesus preach from his particular boat, and that's a part of providence that God had used his boat to speak from, seeing that later on he would be the vicar of Christ. But after he had heard these things, how Jesus asked him to go out and to continue to fish. And anyone who knows anything about the fishing at that particular time in that area, because it gets so hot, that the best time for fishing is at night, in the middle of the night, not during the day. During the day, they have brought their boats in, they wash the nets, they let them dry in the sun, and then take them back out again in the evening. As it took place at this particular point, as St. Luke records for us in the Gospel, that they did not catch any fish at all. And St. Peter, knowing this and even acknowledging it, says, but at thy word, Lord, I will let down the net. It gives us a bit of an understanding of the faith in St. Peter's heart, his faith in Jesus Christ that was growing, growing from events that we'll find, and we want to review a little bit, that take place in the chapter or two before the section that we're reading in today's gospel to give us an understanding about how faith grows, where it comes from, and the importance of a lively faith. With St. Peter, his faith had grown in many different ways. His brother, St. Andrew, had been a um, more active disciple of St. John the Baptist and had been with him most of the time while he was baptized in the River Jordan. When Jesus had completed his 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, and after he had been baptized, um, it was recorded in the Gospels how he was walking away from the River Jordan and heading back inland. And John the Baptist saw him and raised up his voice and said, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And he turned to his, apostle, to his disciples around him and said, He must increase, I must decrease. He gave them to understand that they were now to follow him, no longer John, but to rather follow Jesus and what he had done. And Andrew paid right attention to it right away. He went right after Jesus, spoke to him, asked if he could follow him, and he explained that he had not a place where to lay, but he was welcome to come. Andrew was with Jesus for a few days, and there, there heard, heard Jesus speak, saw him working with people, how he touched the hearts of people, and also how he was starting to cure the sick. And as it got closer to Capernaum, which is in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, where the story for today and today's gospel takes place, and that's the hometown of Peter and Andrew, James, and John, um, Andrew goes to find his brother Peter and tells him of this man that he has met, that John has told him to follow, the many wonderful things that he has taught, how he's touched his heart with an important message here, and the great works that he had done. And Peter, a practical man, as it describes in the gospel stories, he just put it in such a way of saying, well, I'm busy now with fishing. I must get about these particular things. When I have time and when he is in the city, perhaps I will come to see him. Well, anyway, that was there. He didn't want to doubt his brother, but he was also this practical man filled with things that needed to be done. Jesus was there. He started to preach the people. Again, the, the crowds, Capernaum, is a crossroads city of the, northern west, the northwestern part of the Sea of Galilee. A lot of people would come by. People started to hear of what Jesus would speak and what he would, uh, that would touch their hearts, the miracles that he had done. And so they listened to him and watched the miracles taking place, and, and Andrew was there, and Peter came and saw and listened to the various things that were taking place, and it started to move his heart a bit. To the point, it seems, that I don't know if it was St. Peter or St. Andrew or wherever the invitation came from, but at some point, Jesus was invited to come into Peter's house, whether for a meal, whether to spend the night, whatever it was, but he went there. And Peter's mother-in-law was sick, probably quite ill. Jesus went up to her and cured her, healed her right away, and then she got right up and started to serve the meal for them at that point. This had to have touched Peter's heart. The next day, Jesus is out speaking to people. His words mean many things to them. He is speaking to them while he's doing that. Crowds of people are coming to be blessed because of their sickness, and he heals them. At one point, a man possessed of the devil comes up near Jesus, and the devil yells out from the man that's possessed, says, What art thou to do with us here? 
He says, thou art the son of God, and he tells the devil to be quiet and cast the devil away. Peter hears all these things, watches all these things, and yet still the practical man must go back to work that night. So he goes back out to, to work that night, which is with his companions, James and John, and they take their two boats and go out to fish in the middle of the night in the Lake of Sea of Galilee. They came back in. They caught nothing. That's not that unusual for them, for it to happen, especially in the heat of the summer. So they came back in. They were washing their nets, doing what they needed to do, because they didn't take care of their nets. If they didn't wash them correctly, let them dry correctly, mend them when they needed to be, there goes their livelihood. They were practical men. A crowd was coming. They could hear it, but they were still busy with the job they had to do. The crowd came closer and closer toward them, and as the gospel says, presses Jesus right up against the water. Almost if they could push him into the water, they would. He climbs into Peter's boat, asks him to be taken back a little from shore, and he speaks to the people. Wonderful words of comfort, to the point it seems that they dispersed at least a little bit. But then he turns back to Peter and he says, take your boat and go out, and you'll get a, a great catch of fish, a draught of fish. And, and here's the challenge to Peter at this particular point. His faith is building. He's heard the, one, the things, the words that touch his heart. He's seen the sick that have been cured. He's heard the devil say what he has about being the son of God. He's heard these things, but he's still a practical man. And he says that in as many words when he responds to Jesus. He said, Master, because he has respect for him. He sees these things. He knows he's a holy man. His brother Andrew was excited about them, and many other people were there. They couldn't all be led astray. So he addresses him politely, Master, we have labored all the night and have caught nothing. But at thy word, I will let down the net. Faith was growing inside of him. The things he had seen, the things he had heard, all these were helping that faith to become stronger and stronger within him. A lively faith. And so he went. The story is there. He goes out. And he catches so many fish that he has to ask Peter and, or, or James and John to bring their boat out too, which yet yeah, that too became so full it almost sunk. They brought the both boats back to land. The people are marveling about it. And the one who's most marveling about it are Peter and Andrew and James and John. Because in the middle of the day, they had not just caught just a few fish, but so many. And St. Peter, in his spirit of faith now, his faith is growing. It's really grown strong because the miracle he's seen that has been worked on him. He saw his mother-in-law cured. He's seen others cured. He heard the words that touched his heart, but now he's seen this. Something worked directly for him and to help him in his livelihood. And he acknowledges his sinfulness of his nature, that he is not necessarily the good man, the strong man that he should be. Depart from me, O Lord. For I'm a sinful man. But Jesus, you know, he, he, he hears them. He hears that particular words. And he says to him, fear not. Fear is that one mark that takes away faith, that weakens faith in an individual. If anyone has a weak faith on their own, fear is going to be a great part of their lives. He knows his faith must grow and become stronger when he says, fear not. And he opens to him an idea here of what his plan will be. He will no longer go out on the Sea of Galilee to catch fish. From henceforth now you will come and catch men. Come follow me. And the testimony to his great faith is that, as it's recorded in the Gospel of St. John and elsewhere, that leaving their nets and that James and John also had left their father and followed him immediately. He put such a trust in Jesus and all that he saw. He didn't know what the future was going to bring, but he put such a trust in him that he left his nets and followed, knowing that all this fish and all these things here would, would supply money and livelihood to his wife, to his mother-in-law, take care of those particular things. He trusted now in God. We witness then through this story of the gospel a growing spirit of faith in Peter. A manliness of faith in him that becomes stronger and stronger by every event. That he does not waste the graces that God gives to him as he sees and hears and even experiences for himself how much God loves him and the very things that God will do. His faith grows and becomes lively. 
It's that spirit of faith that I pray for the fathers of our parish today. That type of a faith. Not a faith that you can go out and go fishing right now and catch a big bag of fish. That's not the spirit of faith we're talking about. We're talking about a faith that is so alive, that grows stronger and stronger day by day, that recognizes the grace of God working in every way by his providence. The grace of God that builds up as a result of prayer, of reading, meditation, reflection. Meditating on the words and the scriptures themselves, seeing what it is that Jesus says, going step by step with them to the point that nothing, but nothing will shake that faith. And whatever God asks will be done. What I'm praying for here for, for the men in the parish is not just belief. I don't want you to say, I believe in God, and that's good enough. It's not. I already told you a part that even the devil cried out, Instead of being cast out of the individual, he acknowledged that Jesus is the Son of God. If there's any created individual who has faith, the devil has great faith. But it's more of a belief. He believes in God. God is there. There's no, no doubt about his existence. But for all of his belief, it gets him nowhere. He is still caught up and will be for all eternity in the fires of hell. So belief in God is not enough. It can't be. We can't just say, well, Father, you're talking about having a lively faith, but isn't, I already believe in God. What more are we talking about here? What we're talking about here is, despite not having visions or words or devils and no great miracles worked in front of me, that I know that God has come, given us his church, he has given me through revelation all these things and told me much about himself, that through my prayers and reflections I understand these things about God, if I am honest, I see the way God works in my life step by step each day, even though I am a sinful man. That God still works and takes care of me in that way. And if I acknowledge it better and better in thanksgiving and gratitude to Almighty God, by really making the effort now to live the Christian manly life, the manly virtue of faith, to the point of what Scripture says, the just man lives by faith. That faith rules my entire life in the practice of virtue and overcoming sin and conquering the world in my life. All of these particular things and more to demonstrate clearly to all around my faith is strong. My faith is alive. There is nothing out there that will shake it. And that whatever God asks of me, I'm not going to look at it in some reasonable manner and say, well, I'm not sure if I need to do this right now or if I can do this right now. God, maybe there's something else you could have me do. Maybe there's some other law or this law is important, doesn't apply to me right now, and whatever else. All these various excuses that we can come up with. But rather, right away, we give in. We understand this is what God asks. Waiting for him even, he doesn't have to demand it if he asks it of me. I will fulfill, I will follow you know, Peter, when he said it, he, he started out with a bit of reasonableness that was still in there. His faith was not as lively as it could. He was respectful, master. But he says, we've labored all the night. In, in other words, don't you realize, fishermen go out at night. We've been out all night. We caught nothing. We're washing our nets right now. We have to let them dry so we can come out back out tonight. But faith conquered that reasonableness. Faith stepped in and stopped him from saying, no. We have gone all the night. We've caught nothing. It is not good to go out in the day. There's no fish out there. We'll go out tonight, not now. No, faith changed. But he said, at thy word, at thy word, I will let down the net. That trust in Jesus is so great, so strong. Not knowing what was coming up ahead, the great fish that would be caught, just at thy word I will do it. You're a holy man. I can't see into the future and know what's there, but I trust. I trust in something here. That if you want me to do it, it must be important, and so I will. There's a part in the wedding ceremony that always impresses me whenever I have a, a, a marriage for a couple. 
In the particular ritual that I use, there's several different rituals that have um, the exhortations that come before the marriage vows are pronounced. In the particular ritual that I use most frequently, there's a testimony to the spirit of faith that the couple have in each other. And it's basically, I don't remember it all word for word, but the testimony of it is that you know there is sorrow and trial and difficulty to be had in every life, and you know it will be part of yours. It will guarantee it will be part of it in every particular way. You know that. It's not going to change. Just because you're married, everything doesn't disappear. But yet, nevertheless, knowing that, you're still willing to take each other for better, for worse, for richer and poorer, for sickness and in health, until death. Surely these are beautiful words, it says, about your undying faith in one another and in God himself. We don't know what the future is. A married couple coming together, their joy, their love for each other is strong. But they know, they, rather they don't know what is coming up. Master, if they could say, there is a lot to come here. We are almost fearful for the future. But at thy word, and the blessing that comes for us for marriage, at thy word we will continue and have a part of us. It's households like that that really have the greatest blessings that come to them. It's households like that that are led by husbands and fathers who are filled with the spirit of faith. Not just belief in God. Not just saying, I believe in God and we have God and we acknowledge him and oh good God and we say a few prayers. But it occupies every part of my life. Everything I do think and say reflects my belief. I have faith. A practical, lively faith. The changes it brings in households like that. Trials and difficulties come. But faith, trust, love in God gets them through. And in fact, the trials and difficulties bring great blessings on such households. Because they know that God is right there. Jesus has been invited to be a very important and active part in such a married life. And the more he is allowed to be an active part in there, whether it's through like a consecration and throne of the Sacred Heart, whether it can be by other prayers, by coming together as family in, in time of prayer, in coming for Mass, receiving communion, whatever. In the various events that take place in the day, always making the decisions that demonstrate that I have faith that I believe in God and I will do what God asks me to do, what he commands me to do. I will not turn away from anything else. That's a lively faith. That's the faith we want to see. And that's the faith I pray for for you men today. The world outside there, I mean, you don't need me to tell you that. But if it's the one thing that the world outside works its greatest effect on husbands and fathers is that very worldliness sucks that faith away. You know, the faith, the world rather, is practical. The world looks at religion as something that is either to be kept in check quite a bit, don't demonstrate it out to me, or to be ridiculed as something that is for weak-minded people. And so our men have to go about the world and their jobs and associations with other people being faced with the constant conflict of living their faith, being strong in faith, and yet have to buck up against, if you will, the world itself and all of its worldly values and things of that nature. The things the world prizes as being important and goals. From worldliness to a modesty to language and whatever else it might be. They're faced with this, and know you are, every day. And it's going to take a strong spirit of faith to make it through. You don't necessarily have to stand up in a soapbox while you're going about your your jobs or work at school, whatever else it might be, work in society today. But to be the good example of the Christian life, that demands strength. It demands faith in something higher than the world. Faith in something higher than in the opinions of men, faith in God, faith and trust in everything that he 
proposes to me with the determination that I will follow him. I will live for him because I believe in him. And if I truly believe in him, then I will demonstrate it by my actions. I will have a lively faith. And with that lively faith will come such a trust in him that can never be shaken. And with that faith and trust now, I've got the strong foundation for charity, both for God and for my neighbor. All starts with faith. Faith is such an important virtue. There is so much out there that causes that struggle, like I've said, but faith can be the antidote to that if we willingly live by that faith each and every day. So again, I ask you, pray with me for this intention for the day, for fathers of our parish, and for those who would be fathers, men who believe they have a marriage vocation and either... Um, have found their partner in life or have not yet done so and are leaving it to God to help them by providence to show them that partner. Whatever it might be, practice this faith. Make it something that's lively. Pray for it. Faith just doesn't come automatically. It's something that has to be prayed and as a virtue it needs to be exercised more and more. It's in our souls from baptism. It's there with sanctifying grace. But you and I need to exercise it more and more, practice that spiritual faith, live by faith, and then it grows and becomes stronger and stronger day by day. Our Lord tells us about the kingdom of heaven, which is this faith like the size of a mustard seed. You know, it's not a very big seed. But he says it can grow into a mighty bush, a mighty tree, so the birds of the air come and make their nests in the branches of it. It can start out small and become huge if we make the effort and pray for it. That's what we're doing today. Praying that faith will be strong, faith will be alive, faith will guide you every step of the way. And when it does that, it will bring great blessings to yourselves and to your family because God blesses the head of the household and through that to the rest of the family. It's important that the head of the household be strong and lively in faith if the family itself will be strong. Let's pray then. Like I said, we're going to pray for this important intention. Not just today, but always, but most especially today because of Father's Day. Pray for this strength of faith. Pray, pray for this growth in faith. Pray for a faith that is so strong and so lively that nothing but nothing out there will shake it. We will not be people filled with the reasonableness of the world, but a spirit of faith and trust in God. We can get there. If only we pray for it, and then once that grace comes, practice it, live by it day by day, and watch that faith grow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.